welcome to the 2020 APSA Cancer Committee uh, presentations. This past year was a busy one for the APSA Cancer Committee as we had prepared for our IPSO and APSA seminar. Unfortunately, this seminar would have to be postponed to a future meeting, but nevertheless, the hard work of both IPSO and APSA members was appreciated, and we were able to put together two sessions that I, we hope the membership will find interactive and uh, educational addressing areas in pediatric cancer. I'd like just to take a minute to, to thank uh, APSA Cancer Committee from 2019 to 2020. Their names are currently being shown on the slide. And a special thanks to uh, Roshni Dasgupta and David Roddenberg for their leadership in creating the sessions that you are about to see. What you're about to see tonight is on rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma is a complex pediatric tumor, but over the past several years, a number of technical approaches for diagnosis and therapy have been developed. The, the session you're about to see are four case presentations in with some of these new advances that'll be important for the pediatric surgeon to understand. We hope you enjoy it. And I am here to introduce and kick off the topic uh, for our discussion tonight. We have several members of the APSA Cancer Committee that will be presenting cases and then talking about the management of these patients. We're going to talk about some things that are specific to the patients and the sites that we're talking about, but also covering some just general guidelines and rules that apply for patients at all sites, like how to manage the local control for the tumor mass and those type of things. But they will be rolled into these sites. Uh, we'll be setting that up as uh, questions and answers. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll be available to answer questions directly. And so I will then pass this over now to Roshni to introduce herself since she's the other senior member for our group. Hi, I'm Roshni Desgupta. I'm a professor of surgery at Cincinnati Children's. I have a uh, significant interest in sarcoma and Dave and I will be here at the end to answer any questions. And we're gonna kick it off with our younger members of our cancer committee. Hello, my name is Tim Louts. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at Northwestern University and Lurie Children's Hospital. And I'm going to be asking the questions today of our other presenters. My name is Emily Christensen Legay. I'm an associate professor of pediatric surgery at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital and Yale University. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, extremity rhabdomyosarcoma. Hi, my name is Daniel Ree. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine. And I'll be talking about paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma. So we're going to kick it off with our first patient. And this is an 11 year old girl who presents with a mass on her leg. So after appropriate initial workup, Emily, what would be your surgical approach? An incisional biopsy or an image guided cord needle biopsy is usually recommended um, and should take into account the location of the tumor and its relationship to important neurovascular structures. In some situations, the minority of situations, a small superficial tumor may undergo primary excision provided that negative margins can be achieved and that limb function will not be compromised. All other tumors should undergo biopsy with a plan for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And with any biopsy, careful planning of the biopsy tract is required as this tract should be incorporated to any attempts at subsequent resection. An incorrect, poorly planned biopsy may unnecessarily contaminate uninvolved compartments and compromise local control, the likelihood of limb salvage, and sometimes overall outcome. Um, likewise, a core needle biopsy to take into account the eventual scope of resection. Moreover, given the generally smaller samples of tissues obtained with a core needle biopsy, care should be taken to obtain a sufficient quantity of tissue for both histology and molecular genetics and multiple large caliber cores verified by real-time involvement of a pathologist um, to ensure adequate viable tissue for complete assessment of biological markers is recommended. In this patient, an open biopsy was performed and it demonstrated fusion positive rhabdomyosarcoma. She next underwent an FDG PET CT, which did not show any enlarged or avid regional lymph nodes. So at this point, what is your management of her regional nodal status? 
nodal involvement occurs in nearly a quarter of patients with rhabdomyosarcoma and is most common in fusion positive patients with patient, in patients with tumors greater than five centimeters of size, with those with extremity or trunk tumors, and in those um, with paratesticular tumors who are older than 10 years of age. Although the current COG protocols currently recommend cross-sectional imaging and FGG-PET to help detect both distant metastatic and local regional nodal disease uh, with lymph nodes greater than one centimeter in short access on standard cross-sectional imaging or those with PET SUV maxes greater than two and a half times baseline suggesting nodal involvement, both the sensitivity and the specificity of PET for nodal metastasis is less than sentinel lymph node biopsy. For uh, extremity and other sites, imaging may fail to detect nodal disease in approximately half of cases, and in other instances may demonstrate false positivity. So regardless of what the imaging shows, uh, patients with extremity rhabdomyosarcomas should have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And a sentinel lymph node biopsy is more accurate than random lymph node sampling. There is no clinical benefit to completion nodal dissection for patients found to have positive sentinel nodes as nodal patients, which are found to be positive, will uh, receive radiation therapy. While several methods of sentinel lymph, lymph node biopsy have been described, we've historically uh, preferred the dual use of technician 99M and blue dye, either ice or sulfon blue, known by the brand name lymphazurin, or methylene blue. Technician 99 is typically injected in nuclear medicine in the tumor about two to four hours prior to the planned biopsy. It's typically injected in four quadrants around the tumor. Follow-up lymphocentrography is then used to identify the drainal nodal basin or basins. And then intraoperatively, two to three millimeters, a milliliters of blue dye should be injected at the beginning of the procedure employing the same four quadrant technique that is used for the technician injection. A handheld gamma probe can be used to identify the area of maximal counts to help guide dissection and nodal identification. And visually identifying blue nodes also guides the identification and their removal. Several studies have demonstrated that simultaneous use of both technician and blue dye improves the success rate of central node biopsy by providing the surgeon with both auditory and visual clues for the lymph nodes. All lymph nodes in the nodal basin with counts greater than 10%, that of the first identified lymph node should be removed. Additionally, there's a lot of recent enthusiasm for the use of endocyanin green or ICG, either as a single agent for central lymph node detection or in combination with another tracer agent. ICG is a water-soluble green dye with near-infrared fluorescent properties, which binds to plasma proteins and then tracks through the lymphovascular system. And through a laser-assisted imaging device, a central node mapping can be performed intraoperatively after a dermal injection of ICG in the same four-quadrant technique, concurrent with uh, real-time lymphangiography. This is still being actively investigated in children, but studies in a variety of adult tumors have demonstrated excellent sensitivity and specificity using ICG with equivalent or superior results to other methods of sentinel lymph node detection. This innovative surgeon did a sentinel node biopsy with ICG and the sentinel node returned as positive. So how would the patient be staged and treated at this point? So if the remainder of the workup is negative for metastatic disease, um, the patient's classified as stage three because this is an unfavorable site with node positive disease group three because the primary um, uh, treatment was an upfront biopsy and not resection and fusion positive. In aggregate, this is, uh, amounts to an intermediate risk rhabdomyosarcoma and this patient will be treated on an intermediate risk pathway with uh, VAC-VI plus or minus temsorolimus for 42 weeks of therapy. The patient undergoes four cycles of chemotherapy and then repeat imaging is performed. They find that the mass has decreased in size and there now appears to be a margin between the major neurovascular structures. What is your recommendation at this point for local control, Emily? If it appears that uh, complete resection is possible without compromising function or resulting in significant uh, anatomic distortion, a delayed primary excision can be performed. 
Um, a delayed primary excision with negative margins allows the reduction of RT to 36 gray, while that a delayed primary excision with microscopic margins allows reduction to 41.4 gray. If on re-imaging, it appears that um, delayed primary excision would not be possible with negative margins, there's no rule for debulking. This patient in that case would receive a, a, a definitive RT with 50.4 gray. Um, and in patients who do receive definitive RT, there is no role for the, an excision of residual mass at the end of planned therapy. As these excisions frequently fail to find viable tumor, they're incomplete and they engender significant morbidity. So next we have a different scenario. Now we have a 12-year-old boy who's referred with an eight centimeter paratesticular mass, which was biopsied at an outside hospital through a transcrotal approach. Review of pathology reveals a fusion negative embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Daniel, what factors are associated with increased failure-free and overall survival in paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma? Fortunately, uh, the paratesticular location for rhabdomyosarcoma is a favorable site of disease. And as a result, the overall five-year outcomes are excellent with overall survival uh, exceeding 94% and a progression-free survival exceeding 87%. However, children greater than 10 years of age, uh, those with tumors greater than five centimeters in size, and those with retroperitoneal lymph node involvement, uh, these comprise a subset of patients with a poor prognosis. In this uh, case scenario, this patient's age of 12, uh, the tumor size of eight centimeters are associated with worse outcomes, and his retroperitoneal node involvement uh, will need to be assessed. So for this patient, what imaging studies would you next obtain? is a little bit institution specific, but in general, uh, cross-sectional imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is needed. A chest CT is used to evaluate for any uh, pulmonary metastasis, and the abdomen and pelvis can need to be performed with a CT or MRI. Uh, my institution orders a uh, FDG PET CT uh, on all patients, a full body uh, PET CT, and this is to look for any metastatic or regional involvement. Uh, as in extremity tumors, the uptake of FDG in the nodal basin, it does suggest metastatic disease. Um, but however, the results of the PET CTs are a little bit hard to interpret. The absence of PET positivity does not rule out nodal involvement. And even the positive findings on PET CT does not guarantee nodal involvement as well. Uh, as uh, Emily uh, talked about before, uh, the studies comparing uh, PET to sentinel lymph node biopsy has been performed. And what they found is that of seven patients who had bi biopsy proven disease on sentinel lymph node, that three of these actually had normal FDG PET scans. In 14 patients that had uh, PET CT showing findings concerning for disease, only four of these were proven to have nodal disease. So the positive predictive value of the PET CT for lymph node involvement was about 30% and the sensitivity was only 57% and specificity 52%. All this to say is that histologic confirmation is required uh, to determine regional lymph node evaluation. So what surgical approach should be employed for this patient? So this patient previously had a transcrotal biopsy, which is the wrong initial inguinal uh, This patient requires an inguinal orchiectomy, uh, and that involves uh, early and high ligation of the spermatic cord, and we'll also need a retroperitoneal lymph node assessment. The approach to lymph node evaluation for the retroperitoneum, uh, it has a varied approach between Europe and North America. Uh, historically, routine surgical evaluation of retroperitoneal nodes was not recommended under most European protocols. Uh, however, the current COG and North American approach is to perform ipsilateral retroperitoneal lymph node assessment in all patients greater than 10 years of age, and for patients less than 10 who have enlarged lymph nodes on cross-sectional imaging. And this is based on uh, high known percentages of nodal involvement in older patients. Recently, oh, sorry, recently SIAP has uh, published patterns of relapse 
And again, this is from the European studies of uh, looking at patients in whom a non-surgical strategy was used for evaluating retroperitoneal lymph node involvement, meaning it was based on cross-sectional imaging. In this study, they found that a third of the patients that were greater than 10 years of age, they experienced retroperitoneal occurrence uh, where compared to patients less than, less than 10, uh, experienced this in only 8%. Comparing, uh, combining the results of the European studies with the North American groups in a pooled analysis, uh, they did look at patients greater than 10 years of age and, and tumors larger than five centimeters and found that those who underwent a retroperitoneal lymph node assessment had superior outcomes compared to those who did not undergo a surgical assessment of the lymph nodes. Uh, and this suggests that an improved outcome in this um, demographic with uh, greater than 10 years of age and greater than five centimeters uh, after the retroperitoneal lymph node assessment. A recent analysis, it does suggest that the optimal number of knowns is eight to 12 uh, to accurately capture nodal disease. And the same for, um, for extremity tumors, there is a potential role for central lymph node biopsy by, use, by the use of ICG. And to summarize, uh, this patient requires, again, an ingle orchiectomy with high ligation of the cord and based on his age and ipsilateral retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Now this patient underwent biopsy through the scrotum. How should this scrotal violation be managed? Transcrotal biopsy excision uh, has been reported in up to 25% of cases. Historically, <clears throat> scrotal violation uh, uh, would mandate uh, a hemiscrotectomy. Uh, recently, smaller data sets have challenged this practice and that they found that the uh, event-free survival for fusion negative patients that underwent transcrotal biopsy uh, with a subsequent inguinal radical orchiectomy, uh, it was equivalent to those who underwent an inguinal orchiectomy. And that challenges the notion that a hemiscrotectomy is needed to prevent uh, increased risk of local recurrence. This area still re uh, remains an area of controversy, um, but the current CUG recommendation is to avoid a hemiscrotectomy unless there's direct evidence of scrotal invasion. In the relatively rare group of a fusion positive patient with paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, there may be a role for a more aggressive management of the scrotal violation. In these patients, uh, the hemiscrotum may get radiation treatment, uh, and if this is performed, uh, uh, contralateral transposition of the testicles is needed. <laughs>